Thank you, Julie. Good morning. The peace of Christ be with you. If you're comfortable doing so, please share the peace of Christ with those around you. Please remain standing as we join our voices in our welcome. The words will be on the screen. We gather this day, bringing with us our hopes and dreams, doubts and fears. Whether you're a visitor, guest, or friend, you are welcome here. If you are fighting disease or recovering from injury, suffering from pain or struggling mentally or emotionally, whatever your shame, your sorrow, Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this beautiful spring morning, and thank you for being with us this past week, and that you are with us now. We ask that you open our ears so we can hear your voice, open our minds so we may receive your wisdom, open our spirits so we may know your leading and guidance, and open our hearts so we may receive your love. We ask all this in your glorious name. Amen. Um, our opening hymn will be on the screen. I don't have the number.
now for the prayer of confession. Um, Please be seated. Thank you. As scripture tells us, if we think we are without sin, we are deceiving ourselves. God invites us into God's presence to unburden ourselves of the sins we carry with us. Please join me as we confess our sins to God using the words on the screen. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon the disciples, creating bold tongues, bold ears, and a new community of faith. We confess that we resist the force of your spirit among us. We do not listen to your word of grace, speak the good news of your love, celebrate the gift of the mercy, or live in the unity of the kingdom. Forgive us, Lord. Let us now take a few minutes to silently confess our individual sins to God. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Um, Please be seated. (laughs) Thank you. All right, let us pray. God, you have made the heavens and the earth. You have revealed your beauty in our creation and inspired the words we are about to read. Please help us now as we read your word. Take us deeper into understanding more about you and your love for us. Amen. Our New Testament reading comes to us from 1 Corinthians. We're um, in chapter 12. Um, let's see, verses 4 through 13. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, and to another gifts of healing by one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another the various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, Greeks or Jews, Jews or Greeks, (laughs) slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The word of the Lord.
given to understand that that is a difficult thing to sing. But I have to confess, you made it sound easy. That was lovely. Thank you very much indeed. What did he do? See, whenever you're a preacher and people start laughing at something that's happened behind your back, you get very nervous. What is that about? Our new, other New Testament reading this morning, as it is every Pentecost, comes from the second chapter of the book of Acts, verses 1 through 21. Words will be on the screen. I invite you, as always, to follow along as I read. And as always, if you have a translation on an app, on a smartphone or a tablet that you prefer to the NRSV that we use here in worship, I invite you to follow along that way. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native languages? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Cheryl, please. Good morning. You going to come join me? All right. bring my notes. How are you? Well, the scriptures this morning reminded me that the people were all given gifts from the Holy Spirit, all kinds of different gifts, including languages. 
And that made a lot of sense to me because God created all of us, but he didn't make us identical. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay? But the bit about the language really interested me. Have you learned more than one language? That's fabulous. I wondered how many languages there were in the world. So I asked an expert, Google, and Google told me there were almost 6,500 different languages in the world. Now, pastor may know all of them, but I don't. But back in college, I started to learn American Sign Language. And do you remember last month I taught you a few signs? Well, the scriptures today gave me a wonderful opportunity to teach you a couple more of my favorites. Are you willing? Okay. All right. Do you remember the sign for Jesus? You take this middle finger and you touch your hand where the nails pierced him at his crucifixion. Jesus. Can you do that? Jesus. Good job. Now, what do you think this sign is? Well, it's a book, but if I put it with the sign for Jesus, Jesus' book, it's a Bible. And that's where we can read all about the great lessons from Jesus. Jesus' book is a Bible. And now my favorite. Are you ready? God. Make your hand real straight, real strong. Go up. God. You know, God created all of us in all of our differences, our skin colors, our size, our abilities, and our languages. But it's our job to tell the world of his love. So I have a little idea how we could do that. Okay? You might remember I taught you Jesus loves me. Remember that one? But we're going to add something to it this time. You guys can help. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. And you, and you, and you. Jesus loves all of us. Jesus. You could do Jesus, I love you. Mm -hmm. Or Jesus loves everybody. And that is the best message in any language. Don't you agree? I'm going to close with a little prayer, but I want you to keep your eyes open this time. Can you do that? Are you ready? Father God, we are all your children. Help us remember to love all your different people that you created. Amen. I brought you a finger spelling chart so you can start learning some sign language too. And then you can help spread the message to other people. Thank you so much for coming up. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks, boys. The year that Columbus set sail from Spain in search of a shorter route to India, the Spanish queen, Isabella, was presented with a book. It was, in fact, a textbook, and she found it confusing. The book was the work of Antony de Nebrija, who was perhaps the most important Spanish thinker of his time. He wrote poetry and literary criticism. He did much to encourage the study of classical languages and literature, and he became something of a biblical scholar. But his most important work was as a lexicographer, which is to say that he studied the rules and structures which govern language. Now, the book Isabella, which received, which confused her, was a book by Nebriha a book that he had presented to the queen himself. It was a Spanish language grammar. 
the first to ever be written, a grammar of the vernacular, to be precise. In other words, it was the, a grammar of the ordinary language spoken in markets, in the fields, at home, and on the streets. Scholar Isaac Villegas writes that the book confused Isabella because, frankly, she didn't understand the need for it. People who speak Spanish, she reasoned, speak Spanish. Clearly, at some level, they already know the rules and the structures governing the language because otherwise they couldn't speak it. Besides, as Isabella pointed out, no other European language had such a published grammar for the very same reason. The very idea is absurd, she says. It is a waste of the royal time. Well, then a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church stepped forward and brought to Isabella's attention some words Nabriha had written in the preface to his book. This is what he wrote. I have found one conclusion to be very true, that language always accompanies empire. After your highness has subjected barbarous peoples and nations of various tongues, the bishop told Isabella, will come the need for them to accept the laws that the conqueror, that is Isabella, imposes. And among them will be our language. This Isabella understood because her mind was set on colonizing other peoples. Colonizing meant suppressing diversity, and that required control, and control could be had by imposing a single language, which is precisely what Isabella then attempted to do and why much of what historically, if inaccurately, is known as the New World speaks Spanish. Now, God, too, understood the connection between control and one language. If we look at the 11th chapter of Genesis, we find the story of the Tower of Babel. At that point in time, we're told the entire earth and all its people spoke one language. But said people became too big for their collective britches and wishing to make a name for themselves, decided they were going to build a tower to heaven. And in so doing, they sought to make a statement. And that statement was, God, look at what we can do with our knowledge and our own effort. We don't actually need to wait for you to come down to us because we can build this tower and get up to you ourselves. And in fact, now that we think about it, we probably don't really need you at all. God, Genesis tells us, astonished at such arrogance, responds not by striking them all dead, which God could do, but by scattering them far and wide and giving them all different languages to speak so they could not understand one another. Now, it's true that though God and Isabella both understood the relationship between language and power, they certainly were not of the same mind when it comes to to diversity. Isabella saw diversity as a threat to identity. All conquered people, to the extent possible, were to become Spaniards, or at least Spanish subjects, and that meant all speaking one language. God, on the other hand, clearly sees diversity not as a threat to identity, but as the heart of identity that each and every child of God can have their own identity, including their own language, and still be a citizen of the kingdom, no matter how scattered, geographically speaking, they happen to be. And this is not just an Old Testament idea. It is very much a New Testament idea, very much a Pentecost idea. Pentecost is a Greek word meaning 50th day so called because it coincided more or less with the 50th day after Passover, which marked the Hebrew festival known as Shavuot, which means the Feast of Weeks. It was one of the three pilgrimage festivals, and that meant that those Israelites who could were, were supposed to go to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate it. Shavuot marked the wheat harvest the first fruits of which were to be given to Yahweh. And according to rabbinic tradition, it was also the date that Yahweh gave Torah to Moses at Mount Sinai. 
So all of this explains why in our passage from Acts this morning, the disciples are where they are. They are in Jerusalem outside the temple. And it also explains why there were so many different people there. Because there were a lot of pilgrims, observant Jews from all over the Mediterranean lands who were there to celebrate Shabbat. And it is also the day, as we know, that just as Jesus promised would happen after his ascension, the Holy Spirit came down on God's people in a new and powerful way. Arriving with a sound like the rush of a violent wind, divided tongues as of fire, a tongue resting on many of the people there, including the disciples, people who, thanks to the Spirit, began speaking in languages not their own, which to that extent was reminiscent of what happened at the Tower of Babel. Now, it is difficult for us to overstate the significance of the events of that particular Pentecost, the one we read about in Acts. And because it proved to be so significant, we need to take a few moments to kind of think about what did and did not happen at that first Pentecost and what it all means, beginning with baptism. For all the scriptural witness linking baptism with receiving the Holy Spirit, there is no baptism at Pentecost. As the Gospel of John reminds us, the Holy Spirit comes and goes as it will, which means that there needn't be any human initiative for the Holy Spirit to act. No need for people to say certain words or to submit to certain actions for the Holy Spirit to come upon them, which is not to say that the sacrament of baptism is not incredibly important. It is. But Pentecost wants us to understand that the Holy Spirit has its own agency. It does its work if necessary in spite of human cooperation or lack thereof. We also need to note that our passage from Acts does not say the Holy Spirit is a wind or a fire. The passage speaks metaphorically, comparing the movement of the Spirit to the sound made by a rushing wind and its presence to fire like flames, which is not to say that the presence of the Holy Spirit is always accompanied by wind and fire. Clearly that isn't the case. They were there at Pentecost. But the presence of the Holy Spirit then was most powerfully indicated, not by the wind and by the fire, but by people speaking in languages other than their own. This too we should note. People weren't speaking in tongues, uttering sounds which form no identifiable language and can only be interpreted correctly by individuals gifted to do so. Scripture is clear. People at Pentecost were speaking in languages other than their own, but fully understandable to the native speakers of that language who happened to be present. And important also is what in these languages, foreign to themselves, they were speaking. Not just random words. They were speaking specifically, verse 11 tells us, of God's deeds of power, which is to say they were speaking proclamation. It was testimony. The Greek word for what they were doing is apophthengestai, a word you can use, which means to speak out, declare boldly and loudly, which is precisely what Jesus, prior to his ascension, said they would do in being his witnesses to all the world. They would speak boldly and loudly. So the significances of Pentecost are many. There's a lot of them. The Holy Spirit came upon God's people in a new and profound way, marking an inbreaking of heaven into human affairs to a degree never experienced in the same way before. Once uniquely found in and with Jesus during his earthly ministry, it came to abide in the souls and lives of human beings. It came like a rushing wind with fire like flames. People spoke understandably and language is not their own. And the promises Jesus made of the coming of the Spirit and the proclamation came true. All of those significances of Pentecost. And there's this. It's often said that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. The event marking the onset of the church's mission. 
And there's good reason to think this. But we need to tease out why. Jesus was with his followers, teaching them, making promises about the future, telling them that he had to die and he had to rise again and he had to go to heaven. None of which made any sense to them until they actually saw it happen with their own eyes. Jesus crucified, Jesus dead and buried, Jesus resurrected, Jesus ascended to heaven. And yet, even once it did begin to make sense, the disciples' collective understanding was still limited. And in that limited understanding, and this is crucial to understanding what goes on in the early church. In that limited understanding, they thought Jesus' absence would be short-lived. They really believed he would only be gone a short time and then he'd return. That is, in their lifetime, they would see Jesus come back. But then day gave way to day, week to week, month to month, and eventually year to year. Life went on and Jesus didn't come back. And Jesus not coming back as they expected is part of the reason for the coming of, Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. As we said a few moments ago, the Holy Spirit uniquely found in Jesus during his earthly ministry became Jesus' presence in Jesus' absence, to help, to teach, to guide, to comfort. But the fact Jesus wasn't coming back as expected is also much of the reason for the church. It is a basic but profoundly significant fact. The church, as we know it, did not exist until after Jesus left. The church is a post-Jesus thing. With Jesus gone and not coming back, at least no time soon, then being a Jesus follower had to become something more than just sitting and waiting, one eye on your watch and one on the door, expecting Jesus to knock any moment. And besides, Jesus' teaching, all those ethics, demanded that you get up out of your chair and live your life as a witness to the kingdom, living that was to be done in and for community. And that meant people coming together and going forth, which meant being fed, being led, being empowered, and that meant church, church led by the Holy Spirit, which is why the narrative thrust of the remainder of the book of Acts after Pentecost is the growth of the church under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Because if you read the book of Acts, what do you find? You're constantly reading, the Holy Spirit did X. The Holy Spirit was way ahead of Paul, doing the spade work, as it were, for the congregations that were ultimately founded. Congregations, groups of people gathering together to worship and to witness, to be nurtured, and to be nurturing. In fact, beginning with Pentecost, the church, understood rightly, does not exist apart from the Holy Spirit. It just doesn't. Because the church was always intended to be about what the Holy Spirit is about. In the words of our welcome, whoever people are and wherever they are in their faith journey, coming alongside them to worship, to learn, and to join hands in working in the community. So there's all that. And yet I wonder if for all the significances that we can find in Pentecost, the most significant of all has to do with Pentecost's blessing of diversity. As Isaac Viegas reminds us, at Pentecost, we see the opposite of what Nebriha and Isabella imagined. We see a world of many tongues. Because for God, there is no one imperial tongue. The Holy Spirit speaks through all languages, thereby makes every language holy. And this is because there is no one people greater than any other. 
No people with the right to tell other people, you've got to stop doing what makes you, you, and start doing what makes you more like us. Pentecost teaches us that God does not speak in a single language, a universal language that is then translated. God speaks through all native languages to all people. And because God speaks to all people in their own language, difference is not denied. Difference is made holy. And such is the reason that Paul writes to the Corinthians about unity and diversity. And such is the reason I said earlier that God sees diversity as the heart of identity that each and every child of God can have their own identity and still be a citizen of the kingdom. Different, yet still be citizens of the kingdom because the same Holy Spirit that came upon the disciples in a new way in Pentecost, enlivening them to speak in language if not their own, is the same Holy Spirit who calls all God's people to the table. It is not coincidental that we celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, on Pentecost. It's how that first Pentecost ended some 2,000 years ago. If we keep reading in the book of Acts, we find out the people devoted themselves, we're told, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer with glad and generous hearts. Communion, it's about a lot of stuff. But surely it is an invitation to come together around a table and let Jesus love us into relationships with one another. I want to take this opportunity to say something. It's why in this church we practice what is called open table. If a lot of churches that you go to, you're not allowed to take communion if you're not a member of that church or not a member of the denomination or if you haven't been baptized. And I will tell you straight up because it's in our book of order that in the Presbyterian church, strictly speaking, you're supposed to be baptized in order to take communion. Apart from the logistics of that, How do you know somebody's been baptized? For me, what happens in communion is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not the work of me. It's not because I say the magic words, because I break the bread and I pour the wine, the juice. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And if somebody walks into this church on a given day that we're doing communion who has no relationship with Jesus Christ, let alone baptized, and feels called to come to the table, and in the process of coming to the table, learns something about Jesus, and is open to a relationship with Jesus in ways they would not have been otherwise, then I say, thank you, God. So that's why everyone, no matter who you are, is welcome at this table. Because to me, That's what Pentecost teaches. It's that everyone is welcome because everyone is a child of God and everyone is loved and valued equally. And let all God's people say, My friends, we've heard the word read, we've heard it proclaimed in response. Let's stand, if you're so inclined, and join our voices in singing. Hymn number 302. 302. The word will also be on the screen.
please be seated. And now, my friends, let us worship God with our tithes and offerings. Let's pray together. Loving God, God of all good gifts, we thank you for those that you give to us, gifts that you give with the intent that we use them to help take care of our own needs, but also each of us, to an appropriate ways, help to meet the needs of others. So we give back to you now a portion of what you've given us, asking that you take it, that you bless it to the good of this family of faith, to our community, and to the kingdom. We pray these things in your holy name. And that all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I have a couple of prayer items to share with you all this morning. Um, the first is from Bonnie Adam, Bonnie and George Adam. They have two. Their great granddaughter London is off with classmates on a trip to New York City. Um, it's a student trip, and just prayers for their safety as they travel and a good time. And um, the Adams' daughter-in-law, Jessica, is also headed on a, um, I, I'm thinking it's a mission trip to Africa with a group of nurses. So prayers for their safety and their work as well. Um, from Jerry Starnes, she had some good news she'd like to pass along. We've been praying for her in the last few weeks. Um, she had some testing done and there was no evidence of cancer in her lungs, which is a, a great joy for Jerry. So. Um, we will rejoice with her with that. Um, uh, to keep um, the family of Francis Borton in your prayers, Ken and Kathy Seelinger um, and family, um, on Francis's passing earlier this week, there's a service coming later in June. We'll have that information for you shortly. Um, and then on this day, on this Memorial Day weekend, we um, honor the lives of those lost in service to our country. All the people, the soldiers, the nurses, the doctors, the personnel, anyone who has lost their lives in service to our country. We hold those people and those families in our prayers.
Please join me now in our litany for Pentecost. The words are up here on the screen. The part you will say will be in bold. Loving God, gracious Lord, creator of us all, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, our brother, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, moving over us, Lord and giver of life, have mercy on us. Look at our world, broken by sin. Look at our hearts, broken by grief. Look at our minds, shaken by confusion. Have mercy on us. Forgive our short-sightedness and open our eyes. Forgive our hate and empower us to love. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Have mercy on us. On those who are angry, on those who are hurting, on those who are weary, on those who work for peace, on those who protect and serve, on those who suffer loss, on those who are vulnerable. Have mercy on us. Give wisdom to those who lead. Give patience to those who wait. Give healing to those who hurt. Have mercy on us. Father, from one man you made every nation of humanity. You make the sun shine and the rain fall on the wicked and the good. You so loved the world that you gave your only son. Have mercy, Lord. Jesus, you took on human flesh and became the brother of the human race. You suffered great injustice to bear the sin of the world. You are the tree of life whose leaves bring healing to the nations. Holy Spirit, you moved the apostles to speak the languages of all nations. You let your word go out to all people. You call and gather your church from all the world. Have mercy, Lord. See our world and our nation. Help the helpless, strengthen the weak, soften the hardened, warm the loveless, cool the angry, cleanse our hearts. Have mercy, Lord. Father and maker of all, you let this world stand because you are gracious. Work that same grace within us that we love because you first loved us, that we imitate you as your beloved children and live our lives in love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and let all God's people say it. Amen. Jesus, Savior of all people and lover of all souls, Show us what love is yet again by setting your selfless love before our eyes. You welcomed tax collectors and zealots and taught them all the way of love. When you were dying, you forgave those who didn't know what they were doing. You gave your friends who deserted you your greeting of peace. Empower us to love, forgive, and give us your peace. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let all God's people say, Amen. Holy Spirit, you caused scripture to be written that we might learn love that is the fulfillment of the law, and that we might know Jesus and follow him in love. You give the spark of faith and you fan the faith, and you fan faith into flame. Move us to put our faith and hope to work with an active love, that we listen before speaking, think before acting and consider the needs of others before our own. And let all God's people say, Amen. My friends, this is the Lord's table. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, you are welcome here. To this table come people who have much and people who have little, people who are strong and people who are weak, People who know much about God and people who are just beginning to learn. People who have come to church all of their lives and people for whom today may be the very first time. People who know that they're blessed and people who frankly aren't quite sure. Because this is not our table, this is the Lord's table. And the same Jesus Christ who died and rose for all people welcomes all people to come and see and taste that God is good. Communion is a reminder of what God has done for us through the life death, and resurrection of God's Son. The God who created us is the God who forgives us and takes care of us. 
the God who calls us to wholeness and everlasting life with Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, here and now, as we share this bread and this cup, we celebrate the love that binds us one to another as brothers and sisters in the family of God. And so it is that all who trust Jesus, whether a little or a lot, and who wish to trust him more, are invited to come and to be part of this feast that he has prepared. My friends, on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord ate a final meal with his disciples. And in the simple act of breaking bread and sharing the cup, explained to them, and by extension, to you and to me, the very purpose of his work on earth. Taking the bread, he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in a similar manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and pouring wine into the cup said, this is a new covenant in my blood poured out for the salvation of all creation. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so it is, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do profess our conviction that Jesus Christ was born, he lived, he died, he rose. But best of all, He's going to come again. And when he does, we will all sit at table together in the kingdom of heaven. My friends, as is our custom, we'll be taking communion this morning by intention, which means that we invite you to come forward as you are directed by the usher to one of several stations here at the front of the sanctuary to receive a cube of bread, which you will then dip into the cup. As I said a moment ago, this act of faith is open to all who trust in Jesus, whether a little or a lot, and of course, this includes all children. And if it's easier for you to remain seated and for us to bring the elements to you, please do that, and we will be happy to do so. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
My friends, we're going to do something that we're supposed to do before we do communion. But I think the Lord will be okay that we're doing it afterwards. And that is, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, the prayer the Lord taught us to pray. So let's pray that together, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have one final hymn to sing together. So I invite you, if you are willing and able, to stand. Let's join our voices in singing. Words will be on the screen. My friends, as always, you are invited at the close of the service in just a moment to join us in Fellowship Hall for some fellowship and some refreshments. And as always, at the close of the service, there'll be a deacon at the front of the sanctuary wearing a blue ribbon so you can identify him or her. Anything at all you'd like prayer for or with you, if you'll come and meet with them, they will be happy to pray for or with you. And now let's join our voices one more time and sing together the words of our charge and blessing. Lord, we make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, help us to show love. Where there is injury, help us to be agents of healing. Where there is doubt, help us to live faith. Where there is despair, help us to give hope. Where there is darkness, help us to be light. Where there is sadness, help us to share joy. Lord, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is giving that we receive, it is pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is denying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and all days to come. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.